I just want to tell you, if you think that, you know, like the Easter message, that that would be the most difficult to prepare for, I think it's the one after Easter. And so just good luck, everyone. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I love the, the way that this passage turns our attention and helps us realize that we don't just celebrate Easter on Easter Sunday. Like we don't just celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday. In fact, what we learn from today in this passage is that because of the resurrection, that is what provides us the greatest assurance. Because if God could not raise his son from the dead, then there is no hope for you to be raised from the dead. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, you and I, for those who trust in Christ, who are saved by Jesus himself, that you are guaranteed with full assurance that you too will be resurrected just as Christ was. That is really good news. And I'll tell you this, this is how the writer of Hebrews transitions us. He takes us from verse 8, uh, from the previous passage of saying, listen, uh, big warning here. Pay attention lest you fall away. It is this warning to those who are or who have fallen away from the faith. And that the writer is making a clarification here between what it looks like to be in Christ and what it looks like to think you are in Christ, but you are not in Christ. Not just for this life, but for all eternity. And so it's like this big warning sign that, that he's trying to get them to just hold on to and to recognize, take heed of this warning so that you will not fall away. But then he turns in verse 9, and what we see in these next couple of verses from 9 through 20 is that he goes from the ministry of warning clear warning to a clear ministry of encouragement. It's almost like a salve for the wound. It's, it's a healing almost. He says, if you understand the warning, listen, I need you to know the encouragement, just like a, a good coach. And this is what he tells us in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 20. If you have your copy of God's word, would you stand with me? Or you can read along on the screens, uh, or you can listen intently. You can grab a Bible in front of you and keep that one, whatever you need to do. I'm going to read this passage for us. It says in verse 9, even though we are speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case, we are confident of things that are better and that pertain to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you demonstrated for his name by serving the saints and by continuing to serve them. Now we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end so that you won't become lazy but will be imitators of those who will inherit the promises through faith and persevere. Or and perseverance, excuse me. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself, I will indeed bless you and I will greatly multiply you. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves and for them a confirming oath ends every dispute. Because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled for refuge, uh, might have a strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind 
the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. God, would you speak to us now, Father, that we can hear you clearly. God, that you would help us become more like your son Jesus today. So, Father, take this promise that we have from you. And, Father, I pray that it would give us a better encouragement to live for you today. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We may be seated once again. You know, it was on June 11th, the morning of June 11th, on 18 of, in 1805, that the city of Detroit pretty much completely burned down. In fact, um, there was so much loss that they had to just simply start from scratch in rebuilding the city. And they were able to do so. They were able to uh, even change uh, the city streets. They were able to organize different streets. I mean, that's how leveled the city really was. Uh, the problem is, is that on that morning, there was a spark that started, as it always does, and then it went from building to building to building. The problem in 1805 is that there is absolutely no uh, paid professional fire department at this time. In fact, they wouldn't even have a steam engine that would be a pumper for the city until about 1850 or 1860. So they're still 45, 55 years away from that. And so what are they to do? Well, they did what everybody did in this time. They started a bucket brigade. And so all of the city, all 600 of them at this time in 1805, they ran down with their buckets and they formed a line all the way from the Detroit River all the way to where the burning buildings were. And so over and over and over again, they're just passing the buckets, passing the buckets, passing the buckets. And then somebody would get on top of uh, the roof of the burning building. He would take that bucket in one bucket at a time attempt to just put out the fire. And you're, you're thinking, well, why would they do that? Well, I think the answer is pretty simple. The city was on fire. And we think about that. We're like, well, what would make the entire city just stop form a line all the way from the Detroit River to the burning building, spend hours and hours and hours and little to no success, but they just kept going, kept going, and kept going. What made them do this? The city was on fire. See, they understood something. They understood something about the fire tetrahedron, that if you were to just cool the fire with water, then the fire would go out. They had this promise in mind that if we could just get the water from the Detroit River to the seat of the fire, then it's going to go out. And so this is what kept them going. You and I, we have an even greater promise. It's more than just Fire, it's more than just water, it's more than just against a tetrahedron or anything like that. No, we have a greater promise in Christ Jesus Himself. And when we think about this greater promise, it causes our salvation within us to work outside of us. You see, this is where the author begins. He said, Listen, if you truly understand the promise that you have, you will be encouraged to persevere. See, this is what God's promise does for us. God's promise encourages perseverance because you can see the end, you know the end. In fact, all of us, if you have read through uh, any amount of scripture, most likely you know how the story ends, that there is a great promise in the story of God. This story 
that really came out in Genesis chapter three. At the point of sin entering into the world, God makes a promise with the first gospel message in Genesis chapter three. He makes this promise that there will be a day that this serpent will come to an end. Like there will be a day that I will bring forth a son to take care of all of this brokenness once and for all, and the battle will be over. I mean, the people in the, in the line with the bucket brigade, they, they knew what would happen if they could just get the water to the fire. They knew what would happen. And so they kept going, kept going, kept going. They're tired, but they kept going. They were diligent in their task. They were diligent to persevere over and over, bucket after bucket, person after person. They kept going. And this is what keeps us going, knowing the end. But here's the problem. We have uh, a lot of space between the future and right now. Now, we don't know what that space is. Like, we don't know when uh, the fulfillment of Christ's return, we don't know when that is going to happen. We are to live our lives to hasten the day of the Lord. But we don't know, and it seems like a lot of space. Because you think about that after passing the buckets for all this time, I mean, after a while, you just kind of give up and be like, nah, I don't know, man, the city's gone. Let's just give up. But for some reason, they kept going. In the same way that you and I live our lives, we, we have to we have to persevere because we know the end, but what about the now? You see, this is where the writer gets our attention because what good is hope if it's only in the future? I mean, this is how promises work, by the way, right? I mean, this is how you bribe your kids. And all of you who say that you don't bribe your children, I think you're a liar, all right? But um, because... Uh, just the other uh, day, uh, my wife takes all four children to the doctor to get shots. Where's dad? I don't know. All right. Not there. And so Katie has all four kids and they go and get these shots. And Katie makes a guarantee for them. If y'all just let me get through this and get through the shots. I will get you ice cream. But what, what would happen though, if the ice cream never came? You're just still waiting and waiting like, okay, well you said there would be ice cream. I mean, this is how, this is how promises work. And then they are fulfilled. But the problem is many times when we think about the promise of Christ and the hope that we have, that it is only future tense. What about now? What makes me persevere? Because this is what the writer is getting at. I want you to look um, at verse nine. He says, even though we are speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case, we are confident of things that are better and that pertain to salvation. So he's saying, listen, uh, listen, dearly beloved, I need you to understand that we think even more confidently about you. All right, this is against the, the verses one through eight crowd who have fallen away or who are about to fall away. And now he transitioned to those we love, to the remaining, to the remaining, those who are truly in Christ, those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you have surrendered your life to all of you. I love you, so keep going in your salvation. Now this is what happens when you are truly saved, that there is a perseverance that is created within you. I mean, if you were to ask someone, well, how do you know if you are saved or not. Well, you know that you are saved. One of the assurances that God gives us is our perseverance. But that doesn't sit too well 
Because if you say, well, how do you know that I'm saved? Well, I know that I'm saved if I keep going. It would appear that it has something to do with your own will, your own merit, or your own efforts. If I keep going, I know that I am saved. If I keep going, God will remember that and he will be just at the end. That's what our text says. But this is not the way that the writer is explaining things. You see, if you are truly in Christ, your perseverance cannot be made up and it cannot be manufactured by your own merit or by your own will. Instead, for those who are in Christ, perseverance will be worked in you through the Spirit of God and will be out of you, flowing from you because of the Spirit of God within you. And he's saying, so this is how perseverance works. It's not that you just grit your teeth in the name of Jesus and I'm going to do my best. I'm going to keep going. I don't care if even the gates of hell may come against me, but I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. No. If it is up to you, you will be defeated. You have no hope against the winds. You have no hope against the rain when the flood is coming. You have no hope other than the foundation by which you lay your life down on. Matthew 7 says that that foundation is the rock. It is Christ himself. Every other foundation is like sinking, shifting sand. He's saying, be firm on this. Why? Because you can't do it. I can't do it. I don't have enough grit. I don't have enough tenacity. I don't have enough within me to keep me going, to persevere, to be diligent in the things of Christ. I'm going to get selfish. I'm going to mess things up. I'm going to go the wrong way. I'm going to go the wrong direction. But it is Christ in you that keeps you. It is not up to you, but rather it is Christ in you. And so as he works out his salvation within you, it comes out with perseverance. He's saying you will be encouraged. You will persevere to the end if you're in Christ. Do you, that was bad timing. <laughs> Sometimes just ADD just kicks in, you know? Like I want to just keep going, but it's just, I, I can't do it sometimes. But this is what he is saying about perseverance. He's saying, it is because of the Spirit of God in you that you will persevere. Praise God that your perseverance is not up to your own self-will. That's what the world teaches you. You want to grow your business? You got to do this. You got to do this. Get up at 4.30 a.m. and then you work 72 hours in one day and then you return all of your emails. You go and do this business plan. You do this, you do this, you do this. And guess what? You are left just as empty as you started. See, what the Bible teaches is not that your self-will will produce a perseverance in you, but rather it is the Spirit of God that prompts you in perseverance. And now he does give a warning. He says, don't become lazy. So he's matching this with your willingness to participate. You see, it would be completely wrong of us to assume uh, that we can kick back and be like, well, I guess the Holy Spirit's not just, it's not working in me today. I have no energy. I have no strength. I don't even feel like getting out of bed. And so I am just gonna wait for the Spirit of God to create something. Okay, listen, that is being presumptuous. That is is not the way that the writer is describing how your life should be because he gives us that matching warning. He says, let the spirit of God abide in the spirit of God so that it may produce perseverance in you, but do not become lazy. Like don't just sit back and, and wait and pretend like someone else is going to pass your bucket. No, 
the city is burning, you have to reach down and pass your bucket. What is not up to you is to produce the water. But by all means, you better be passing it. See, this is the idea of salvation that we get here and how the working and the the mysteriousness of the the Spirit of God working in us and the anti-lazy, how these things come together. Listen, we're never going to figure it out, but we better bust our tails in such a way that we think it depends on us, but we better uh, surrender ourselves in such a way knowing that it completely depends on the Spirit of God. And so whatever he needs to do to work out in me, I'm not going to be caught being slothful in my approach to the things of God, but rather I'm going to reach down. I'm going to grab the bucket and I'm going to pass it. I'm going to be as effective and efficient as I can. And I'm going to pass it over and over and over again. He's saying persevere because it matters. Why? Because the city is burning. Recognize what is happening around you. Recognize that the world is lost and apart from Christ. What are you going to do about it? So many times you're just saying, well, maybe the pastor will say something. Maybe the kids minister will say something. Maybe the student minister will say something. No, no, no. It is up to the church. It is up to us. Listen, the church is not as strong as its pastor. The church is as strong as you. That's how this works. You want to advance the kingdom of God, then let's be an army of believers who are willing to do whatever it takes. I'm going to get in the river. I'm going to pass the bucket. I'm going to get on top of the roof. I'm going to do whatever it takes so that the spirit of God would move through my efforts and then he would get all the glory. He would get all the praise because it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with us as a body of believers doing everything it takes to help a burning city. Do you want to be? Because this is what he says that they were doing. He's saying be diligent in these things. Well, he gives us examples of these things. In verse 10, he says uh, that he, being God, will not forget your work and the love you demonstrated for his name by serving the saints, and by continuing to serve them. Now, this is where we could easily get off and think, okay, well, I will be justified because of the way I serve. No, 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 because he matches it once again. He says in, in verse, uh, ele- uh, verse 12, excuse me, he says this in verse 11 and 12, he says, now we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence as serving the saints and continuing, being diligent, persevering in those things. Okay, he said, uh, now each of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end so that you won't become lazy, but will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through what? Faith and perseverance. He puts faith and perseverance together. These ideas conceptually are tethered. He's saying, listen, it is by faith. It is not by your works that you are saved. It is not by your works that you will be justified, not by your works that you will do anything, but by faith. And by faith, you will work. Because only a dead faith does not work. You don't obtain your faith by work, but your faith will work. You know, J.C. Rowell says this in his, in his book, Holiness. He says, I bless God that our salvation in no wise depends on our own works, but I never would have any believer for a moment forget that our sense of salvation depends much on the manner of our living. You see, he's saying, listen, this is the way that it's going to work out. If you are truly in Christ, you will be diligent to persevere. You will keep going. And while you keep going, be patient. Yeah, here we go. It makes no sense, really. 
I mean, we're talking about just go, 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 go as hard as you can, fight for it. But while you do that, wait. It seems that they run contradictory to one another, but what the writer is saying is they actually run parallel. That in your perseverance, you would be patient, just as one of the heroes of our faith, Abraham, was patient. See, he goes back to Abraham, and it's no, it should be a surprise to us that this Jewish writer writing today to a Jewish people uses one of their prize members, Abraham. And he says uh, in verse 14, I will indeed bless you and I will greatly multiply you. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham obtained the promise. So what he is building here is the case for how we are to persevere, but then don't be overly concerned about the results or the timing of the results. I mean, how, how long, oh Lord, do we have to wait? How many times do we hear the psalmist crying out in this way? How long, oh Lord, how long, oh Lord, how long have you been praying for the wayward child and still have yet to see that individual come to faith? How long have you been praying for your marriage and it's just still not working? How long have you been praying for your spouse to be healed? How long have you been praying for a relationship to be mended? How long have you been praying for this person or for this job or for this opportunity? How long have you been praying? And, and it's just not happening. And yet you want me to persevere? You see, perseverance in the things of Christ we must be okay with the timing of Christ. I mean, can you imagine if they were passing the buckets on that day in 1805 and they just look up and be like, man, there's more flames. It's like, I, it's not working. Like, I don't, I don't know what else to do. I'm just tired and, and I've, I just feel like giving up. No, they, they did not give up. Instead, they trusted in the process. They trusted in the process. They trusted in the passing. They trusted in the obedience. And this is exactly what Abraham did by faith with God himself, is that he just trusted and he was patient. Now we know that in that story between uh, starting in Genesis 12, but moving on, that, that they had some hiccups in their patience. The Sarah became impatient because, I mean, by the way, at the, in Genesis 12, verse 4, when, when this comes on the scene, Abraham is 75 years old. Sarah is 65 years old. And you're going to tell me that that's not laughable? I mean, I don't blame Sarah. I mean, it's kind of hard not to blame her. I mean, can you think that going to a 75-year-old very young man and a 65, very, very young lady, and you go to them and say, hey, guess what? You're about to have a baby. Probably the 75-year-old man may pass out, and certainly the 65-year-old woman will probably be a little upset as if you were making fun of her or saying something, right? But this is what was happening to Sarah and Abraham. In fact, from that point, they had to wait 25 years for the promise to even be fulfilled. I mean, that joker's 100 years old now. Poor Sarah's 90. At the point where the, this baby was finally born. I mean, can you imagine being 118, year old, 118 years old at your, your son's graduation? Not a good look. But what is interesting is that they waited. You see, God's plan will never be fulfilled in the way that you think is best, in the timing you think is best, in the way that you think is best. It is our job to persevere with a surrender to God. Whatever you want, I'm in. Here is my diligence. 
Here is my perseverance. I'm going to keep running after you. I'm going to keep going after you. And even though I don't see results, I don't see why I'm doing this, the flames seem to be getting heavier and higher and higher. I'm going to keep trusting because I know your ways are greater than my ways. Your knowledge is greater than my knowledge. And so therefore, I bow down to you in your timing, knowing that you work all things together for your good, my good, for the sake of your name, because this is the way that they serve. They served for the name of God. That's what it tells us in the text, for the name of God. If we were worried about not being patient, it is because we are mostly concerned about our own ways. We are mostly concerned about our own name, but this is not the way you persevere. You persevere putting Jesus at the forefront for his name, for his sake, for his plans, for his glory, and whatever he says of you, when it makes sense, do it. When it doesn't make sense, do it. When you understand it, do it. When you don't understand it, do it. Why? Because it is all according to his plan. Therefore, just be patient. Be okay with not understanding everything. Be okay with not seeing the full picture, knowing full well that God can see it all. And in that waiting, he says, in this time period of passing the buckets, you just don't see the results. You're being patient, but you're, you're persevering. He's saying, don't forget your purpose. You see, understanding your purpose, understanding the purpose of God is one of those things that drives you to persevere. It, it drives you to be patient. Like, I know this is what we are called to do. I know this is what we need to do. Therefore, I'm just going to persevere. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to wait because I know God's purpose. And I know my purpose is to do whatever he wills. It says this in verse 17. It says, because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise. He guaranteed it with an oath. There has never been one time in history in all of mankind and before the foundations of the world for all eternity, there will never be a time that the purpose of God changes. He says it is unchangeable. This is the immutability of God, that God cannot change, nor can he lie. In fact, Malachi tells us that in chapter 3, verse 6. He says, for I, the Lord, what? Cannot change. I do not change. I will not change. For I, the Lord, he is immutable. He is unchanging. Therefore, his promise will never change. His promise that says, listen, I, there will be a day that I come back for you. That promise is, is guaranteed for those who are in Christ Jesus. He says, I will come back and get you. You remember the disciples, they're asking like, Lord, how do we, we don't even know where you're going. How can we get to you? And he's like, listen, guys, it's going to be okay. You don't, you don't have to worry about that. I'm going to come get you. Be perseverance in what I've called you to do. Be diligent in what I've called you to do. Understand your purpose. Understand that it's not going to happen in the way you think it should. And so just be patient, but I will fulfill my purpose. I will fulfill my promise, my promise that when you stand before God as the righteous judge, he will see you as righteous. That he will not see you as unclean, but as clean. Understand what, when I come back, I'm going to wipe away every tear from your eyes. And understand that I am making all things new for the glory of God. That the old will pass away. The new will come. And understand this, that there will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more cancer. There will be no more brokenness. There will be no more sin. There will be no more need to have graves or tombs. None of that because I am coming back to you. I will get you. I will bring you to myself. Why? Because this is the purpose of God, that he would glorify himself in you. That's a crazy thought. Therefore, because you have this, it changes the way we live right now. We know the promise. 
We know what is to come. We know what is taking place. We know, and therefore, we are all the more diligent in our work. The question is, will you simply just get in line and pass the bucket? Like if we want to be a church that really makes an impact for all eternity, it's going to require every single one of us. And just like we are wondering, well, what makes, the, what makes Green Acres just stop doing what they're doing and serve the, the city? Like what, what makes them stop and, and help give food to the hungry? Like what makes them stop and go and serve at schools? What makes them stop and go to East Africa, to go to Brazil, to go to the ends of the earth? Like what makes them do that? What makes them surrender their lives in that way? What makes them give up their money? What makes them give up their time? Well, because the city is burning and there is work to be done because here is the truth of the gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ, for every person who perishes apart from Christ will end apart from Christ and in eternity in hell. And if you understand that truth, then how much do we have to hate someone to not tell them of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we have the water, we can quench the flame, we have the source of life, and his name is Jesus. It is just our job to get in the river, to pass the water, pass the bucket, get in line, and it doesn't matter my position in line. It doesn't matter if you know my name or don't know my name. As long as you know the name of Jesus, you're going to have life eternally. Let's be that church. Let's be that people because I know it's your desire. I know it's your desire. You know how you can start? Just go right outside these doors and there are invitations and you can just grab those three circles and those invitations. You can just grab them. Start there. Start there. And then create a perseverance. Let the Lord work this out of you. And then start talking to people about Jesus. Start inviting them to church. You know that 85%, 85% of all people who are not in a church or who do not know Jesus, 85% of them will say, yeah, I'll go to church with you. And did you know that every single person in this room on average has seven people in their sphere of influence right now who doesn't know Jesus and is not connected to the church? Easter Sunday should be the norm in this house because not so that we could just fill seats, who cares? But every person who is here is, has a soul, has a name, and that name matters to Jesus Christ. And he died for them, and they are in desperate need of that truth. Let's pass the buckets. Let's get in line, and let's get after it. Why? Because the city is burning. Let's pray, God, would you give us a desire for you. God, would you give us a boldness? Because, Father, we know that if we have an anchor for our soul in you, God, we know for sure that we don't have to be timid. We can be bold. We can be courageous. Because, Father, we know that you're holding us according to our own salvation and according to your security that we have in you. So Father, I pray that we will live as a people who know the promise. God, that we would live as a redeemed people, understanding with a great compassion for the city around us, for the people around us, and to the ends of the earth. God, I want to be that person God, so please just help me know where to get in line and I'll pass the bucket. Father, please. God, I pray for all my brothers and sisters right here. God, that you would renew an energy within us, Father, that is for your glory. And that is it. So Father, help us as we leave from this church right now and go outside, God, would you remind us 
of your purpose. And God, thank you for involving us in that. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.